All right, so kind of a little background. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for a couple of years, or for several years now, uh, there's a group of us that mentor students at Mount Carmel High School. We have an amateur radio club, and launching high altitude balloons is one of the activities that we've been doing for a long time. And about two years ago, we became aware that you can, if you gather uh, used weather balloon electronics or radio sons, you can reprogram for amateur use. And so you just have to track their signals, and they broadcast their GPS coordinates. So um, we've been basically getting free electronics by doing that. And a lot of these will fly out to remote places like out in the desert or, or far from home and you lose the signal just trying to listen to them from San Diego. Uh, so um, Pop has been generous enough to let us put a receiver on Toro Peak and on Otay Mountain. And recently um, uh, we got in touch with some people at Scripps Institute of Oceanography and they were saying we're preparing for this big atmospheric river uh, survey or research. And I asked them, well, are you interested in the data, you know, where the sons when they land or when they go to get on the distance, you know, because we log that data, we can send you a file for each flight. And they said that, you know, we've been having trouble losing flights early. And so um, we made arrangements that uh, of all the songs that, that fly, I'll send them a log of what we received. And it turns out a lot of them, they were losing actually pretty early in the flight. Uh, some of them, they're launching um, around uh, San <clears throat> Bernardino Mountains, and apparently they're getting behind the mountains. Because during these atmospheric river events, the, the winds are very strong, blowing out to the east northeast, so they get behind the mountains. And they were also launching from Catalina Island, and they were losing the signal early too. And I'm not sure why, but I said, "Hey, if you send us your file, we could then kind of append it to the data we have um, and continue uh, to get the data, you know, over a long distance." Um, so over three atmospheric river events, I did that, and it ended up being a total of 99 flights that, that we sent them extra data on. And so, for example. <clears throat> Here's kind of a map of um, one's launch from Catalina, and the, uh, I don't know why I did that to my arrow, I made a Z out of it, but that's supposed to be a straight arrow, I guess, open office change it. Anyways, where the black line is, is where, so the, the whole red path to the balloon is the, was the flight path of the sun, where the um, <clears throat> black line is, is where they lost the, the signal from Catalina, and then the, um, beyond that is where uh, we picked it up till, you know, pretty close to where it landed. I don't know if I skip one or two here. Here's kind, of a, here's kind of a 3D view of, of how far it was heard. So the red area is the um, distance that their receiver heard it through, right, where it turns to blue is where, at the end of the red is where they lost it. And um, our receiver, so this one, it was uh, the receiver on, on uh, Coral Peak, I'm sorry, Otay Mountain. Um, and it heard it all the way out a long ways. So, um, so that was where they basically add their data. Yeah, because they lost it 103 kilometers, and we, we heard it all the way up to 266 kilometers. And, and similarly, there's... Um, That's in the river, right? Um, in the river? It was being carried by the... Atmosphere. Oh, exactly, yeah, right. So you can, you know, you can see these, this is, I mean, it was during the same event. This one in San Bernardino, you know, it went quite a ways out, in a way northeast of uh, Lake Havasu. Uh, and this one they lost even earlier. This is the one they, they launched at... Uh, in San Bernardino Mountains, and that the black line is where they lost the data, and they didn't get any data beyond that. And Toro Peak is like got a great view of that whole area, so I sent them the file for that. So yeah, they lost it at 48 kilometers, and Toro Peak heard it out to 327 kilometers, so a long way. And kind of the 3D view of that is, <clears throat> see that's the red area. That's the only data they had, um, and then Toro Peak heard it all the way till you know the little peak there. That's like where the balloon burst, and then. You know, fell back to the ground. So during these atmospheric rivers, after each flight, um, or an hour or two afterwards, I would be loading files to a Google Drive that they'd set up. And so they were, they were very appreciative. So kind of a little added benefit of these receivers that uh, lets us collect the radio sounds the Weather Service launches. Um, it receives the, same, the ones we reprogram and launch at the school. Uh, we set it to an amateur radio frequency and relaunch them. And so it tracks those. And the students can then follow where they go. And then just a little side benefit when I thought that, because uh, I heard of this atmospheric river study they were doing, I say, hey, if you need extra data, we may, it may come in useful, let me know. And sure enough, they did. And so kind of glad to have been able to help them. So. What kind of listening station do they have that they have? They have such a short range. You know, I even offered to look at it. I go, maybe there's something wrong with your antenna. Because that setup, they actually, it's a whole commercial setup. Uh, I think the company name, I think it's pronounced Vasalia. Um, and the weather service uses them, and they normally work really great. So I don't know if they got bad equipment or they did something 
they set it up incorrectly. So it should work a lot better, a chance to but for some it. reason it didn't. I mean, maybe with the San Bernardino Mountains, it might just be, in fact, they did blow behind the mountains. And How much they're, are they? They're, they, the area they launched called Seven Oaks Dam, so I don't know if they're at the bottom of a tall dam to be a bad place to set up a receiver station for things that are gonna go beyond the dam. Um, but for some reason, they were having trouble with Catalina Island, too. And I think they resolved that because they were hearing them a lot better on the later flights. But they were going to talk to the manufacturer about what's going on. So normally, the system doesn't have that limitation. But something was wrong with the way they were using it. I think they normally actually don't care. Normal weather forecasting, they only care about the data up to the stroke of loss, you know, top of the stroke of loss. They don't really care about the data on the way down. But this study, they do. Yeah, and they actually lost it pretty. They were losing some of them, like like, like in the six, seven kilometer um, altitude. So they definitely would have wanted to have it beyond that. But you know, it was the data that the, the Raspberry Pi is on the receivers. It's just for each flight. It's another another file. So it was really easy just to drag the, the log files over to them. Um, so yeah, we were able to kind of provide a benefit to them. So. And it was easy enough to do. Yes? What frequency are those things on? So the Radioson meteorological band is from 400 to 406 megahertz. Um, and so they, they can have a lot of songs in the same area at the same time. They just have to set them to different frequencies. Uh, when we reprogram, we reprogram to about 430 megahertz. So they're, they're no longer going to be on the meteorological frequency. And, uh, and so when Gene's going to talk about, we have them both send their position that we can, in the 4FSK mode, that we can hear down to a very weak signal, a very good sensitivity. And Gene's been experimenting, you know, because we've got like a box of these things now, um, with doing things like adding cameras and other sensors to them. So, uh, you know, it's pretty inexpensive to, to launch. You know, we get free electronics, so we just have to buy the balloon and the gas and some new batteries. What kind of transmitters in there? SK? Well, we program it. It's a maybe Phil can answer. It's some STM microchip, and so depending on whatever oh. software you load in there. Uh, so I'm not, I don't know the modulation format the Weather Service uses, but FSK 4800. Was it FSK 4800? Which, which the harbor is designed to do? Just two FSK. Two FSK. Yeah. But the, um, this, this, they they broadcast. It's about 17 dBm is the transmit power. So. Um, it's 50 good. milliwatts. What's that? 50 milliwatts. Right. So it's uh, right. So um, which tell them how they coordinate their frequencies in the meteorological band. So actually, I don't know how they keep from stepping on each other. Um, <laughs> you know, launching two at the same frequency within the same you know within close enough area. Um, I I'd be interesting question if it's to the manufacturer. You know, is it they're running off a website? So I don't know. It seems to be kind of hit and miss. And what I actually had to do is when. While I was trying to track their signs, our receivers can only track one, one signal at a time, at least like the one on Toro now can. Um, so normally searches a meteorological band. When it picks up a radio sign, it locks onto it until, and then it's only listening to that one uh, that, on that frequency until it loses the signal, like typically when it lands or goes, drops too far behind some terrain. Then it initiates a, re a new search. So I coordinated with them. They were going to use just two different frequencies. So we can program them to only, instead of doing a full search, to only listen to two frequencies. And that way, we weren't being tied up listening to some other sound off in a nearby area. Because these will hear them out to about about 400 kilometers from the receive site. Well, tell me what you told. Uh, t tell them what you told me about how they pick their actual frequencies, the Scripps guys. How they pick it? Yeah. So basically, they just. Pick a random number, right? What's they kind of, yeah, they seem to be have just kind of chosen at random. I don't know if they looked around to see where the others were, but, um, and they've done things like they, they were going to alternate between two frequencies because sometimes they fly for so long, they were launching them every three hours, and the, the one they'd launched three hours prior hadn't yet landed, <clears throat> and there was one time where they had two of them on the same frequency, so I was kind of hit and miss which one I'd receive because they're, on the, they're stepping on each other. So most of the time, they would alternate between two frequencies, so that way, um, there's never two on the same frequency at the same time because the further one that landed, you know, was, was already long off by six hours later when they used that frequency again. These things used to be programmed to turn off shortly after birth, which of course made it impossible to recover for us. Uh, the Australians talked them in to the manufacturer and made them the fall timer about eight and a half hours. Right. So typically they, they, yeah, when they start an eight and a half hour timer when they birth, it takes about, it takes about a uh, Half. So a typical flight is uh, 90 minutes to ascend from the surface to about 30,000 kilometers, and then 30 minutes to free fall 
to the ground. Um, they usually don't use a parachute. And so they'll hit the ground at about 15 meters a second, but they don't weigh much. They're 85 grams, they're in a big padded uh, piece of uh, styrofoam. So, you know, they hit you in the head or bounce off your windshield or hit an airplane, you know, it wouldn't matter. So the ones that fly now, they actually have a sticker on there. They say, you know, harmless meteorological instrument. They say, do not return to the National Weather Service. Um, they consider them disposable. And it's probably because the sensors on them are very fragile. There's a very fragile external temperature sensor, a te temperature humidity sensor. Um, and another issue is sometimes, you know, with someone may find them after they've been out laying up for a year. And so they're going to be very deteriorated from the elements. So and probably more expensive to recalibrate and refurbish them than to just keep spitting out new ones. So when you say you reprogram them for, for ham use, do you, do you actually uh, hack their software or do you just go past we, it with a Raspberry Pi? So, we, like so we, delete, we delete the software that's in it and just rewrite it, rewrite it with our own software. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's just a completely, it just basically just blows over the software that was there. Talk to Steve Palmer, WA, I think it's called. Uh, way back when he was much younger, he and his friends flew a balloon package. And just for the hell of it, there was some Russian on it. And it was recovered. <laughs> and it made the news. They just referred to V. Putin, Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> of course, now he just put big Chinese symbols on it. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Cool. Well, I guess um, I'll let Gene continue with. Uh, he's got. Uh, he's been the one magically coming up with sensors and cameras and having these reprogrammed songs. So Toro and Otai, here's an example of. This is the shelf we just installed like a week and a half ago um, on top of a Otai. So it has. Um, mm -hmm. There's three Raspberry Pis on it. The one that's number three is, is the one that Gene was describing with the lower receiver. Numbers one and two have uh, software-defined radio dongles attached to them. Number one has one dongle. Number two has two dongles. So actually, we can now track multiple SONs and devices at the same time and we get some redundancy. <coughs> um, and so we've got, uh, for the, underneath that eight-port switch, the reason you use an eight-port switch is um, some of the neighboring shelves and devices uh, at Otai needed to, uh, were not enough internet spigots around. So we kind of help split it out that way. Um, and this, uh, there's a low noise amplifier and filter up uh, at the antenna, so through a bias to you run five volts up the coax cable to power it. The, um, one of the things we had to do, so there's, having a low noise amplifier, you don't want to get overloaded with this local signals where, on the, where the repeaters are mainly. So we really care about two ranges of frequency. We care about 400 to 406 megahertz, which is where the radio songs are, um, and we care about Right, right around 430 to 436 megahertz. So it cuts off where, where the repeaters are. Um, <clears throat> oh, it's funny, somehow this open office didn't display what was in the boxes. But the way we do that, so I was asked a while back, and someone said, well, can you just put two of these uh, filters here? These are soft filters. So I said, well, couldn't you just put them in parallel? And, um, you know, because one will let one signal go through, and one let the other signal go through. Well, a filter out of in band, it's going to look, let's say if you have a 50 ohm load on it, it'll look about like 50 ohms looking into it. Out of band, it's just going to be a complete reflection. So um, you'd have some mismatch in parallel with the other filter. Because these two, uh, the, the coax cables from these kind of join at one common point on both ends for the filters. And so the trick we do is um, the equivalent to an open circuit. Is, is like an infinite impedance, or it's also like a reflection at zero or 360 degrees. So what we did is we added cables to both ends, let's say the passband of this filter, this is a 433 megahertz filter, at 433 megahertz, you're gonna get a complete reflection off of this filter, so we added enough, we added the coax cable that rotates that reflection angle to be zero degrees. And the same thing for the other one. So we make the out-of-band reflection basically look like an open circuit. So this has allowed us to have two separate filters in parallel um, without one loading the other one. So I thought that was a pretty slick trick. That is. <laughs> That's amazing. So, um, Frank that up. What's that? Frank that up. Frank that up. Q and the QE action something. Uh, it's like parallel filters. Yeah. It was, and this was like another one of these examples where it was something I didn't think of doing. But if someone said, hey, can you do this? And I first say no because. And then I think, oh, but if you do this, it can be done. The other thing we needed was um, 
Uh, 70 centimeter antennas tend to not work well at 400 megahertz. It's too far out of band. They often, they usually have a decent amount of gain. You know, vertical has an omnidirectional azimuth, but they got a pretty good gain because they've got multiple elements phased to give you like a collinear effect. Problem is they're too far out of phase at 400 megahertz and they have really low gain. So, and no one's gonna, no one sells a commercial antenna that works from 400 to 435 megahertz because there's like two completely different systems that no one even think of. So, well, you know, ham radio guys, we just make, we need it, we'll make what we need to, to whatever we want it to do. So, um, the design, this picture on the left here is, is a sleeve dipole up at Toro Peak on the end of a mast. So the lower section of it is just empty pipe, it's just for mechanical support. Um, inside there, there's like an exploded view of it. Uh, typical dipole you feed in the center. You know, if you have a horizontal dipole, you have your twin lead or your coax with a bound feed at the center. Well, a way of feeding in a dipole from the end, you know, because the coax has to exit one end, which you know, is the high impedance part is the end of the dipole. So if you make a cylindrical sleeve that at the center point of the dipole attaches to the, the coax, you effectively created another coax outside of the feed coax. And if you make that a quarter wavelength long, um, it's going to have an extremely high impedance between the end of the, end of the sleeve here and the coax. Um, and so the lower half of the dipole is both a choke that, that chokes off any connection to the cable feeding it, and then the upper end of the dipole that's just connected to the center conductor, and you just adjust its length to resonate the dipole. So that antenna works very well from over the 400 to 435 megahertz range we care about. And being inside a PVC pipe, you know, it can survive the elements. So it's sealed inside there. There's some desiccant in there because uh, it's got to deal with Toro Peak's extreme temperatures. And it's got a few coats of paint on it for extra UV protection. So um, it's been working. There's one of these in Toro and there's one of these in Otai. And they went for Chris too, um, for wherever he would want to have an antenna that receives it. So anyways, all this stuff together works pretty slick. And any questions on that? Good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like what an antenna engineer, passive RF people do after they retire. <laughs> so. All right, that's all I got.